distribution uh, for similar items, I think is a critical feature of this. If you look at the distribution of the CBCL or the SWAN, you get normal distributions both for inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity just by redefining how you ask the items. So my view, I've written it down, you can have a copy of this paper if you're interested, uh, my opinions about DSM-5 are that it should be dimensional and that the dimensional descriptions that people are using in psychiatry are not dimensional. They're actually using symptom severity ratings which produce a non-normal distribution instead of dimensional ratings of behavior. So this is a different way of thinking about psychiatric disorders like ADHD. It may not fit for disorders like autism where the behaviors might be qualitatively different. My view is that uh, the behaviors of ADHD are probably not qualitatively different. In other words, they don't deserve a category, but they are quantitatively different in terms of a dimension of underlying behavior that characterizes the human population. I'm not going to go through the details here because I would like to cover some of the other topics, but uh, in uh, uh, this uh, article we also describe one of the uh, other characteristics that I'd like to uh, just mention about DSM-4 and DSM-5 that I think is problematic. How many people have diagnosed uh, an ADHD child? And how many people know whether you use the AND rule or the OR rule? Oh, one person. This is, I think, very important. If you have the symptoms and the rule is, by this top-down definition of what the disorder is, that you have to have information from two sources. How do you get information from two sources? If you ask the first item, does this child have a hard time paying attention to detail, or even if you ask, how does this child pay attention to detail? What if the teacher and the parent give you different opinions? Do you count that item or not? <coughs> If you use the OR rule, you count it whichever one says it, even if they disagree. If you use the AND rule, you only count it if both of them agree. The correlation between parent-teacher ratings of symptoms of ADHD is 0.3, <laughs> as is the correlation for the, the scales for the Achenbach rating scale or most other rating scale. Maybe a little higher, uh, but not much. It's low. So there often is disagreement. If you use the OR rule and apply it by the usual definitions, you get a prevalence of ADHD when you do a symptom count of about 10% in the population. If you use the AND rule, you get a prevalence of about 2%. Which one do you want to use? Uh, DSM criteria say two sources, but they don't specify whether you use agreement of the two sources or just information of any sort from the two sources. When re-diagnosed by rigorous standards, which um, might be actually more like the ICD-10 standards than the DSM-4 standards, which officially does use the AND rule, we get only 25 percent of the MTA sample, all of which have a diagnosis by DSM-4 of ADHD combined type, only 25 percent of those meet the criteria for ADHD or hyperkinetic disorder by ICD-10 standards when you use the AND rule for symptoms. So this is a, this is a big issue. Uh, I think that the AND rule should be used, but other people don't agree. Uh, the other thing I'd just like to mention, this is an advertisement actually, I don't know if I have, I, I should have started off by saying I have worked for many pharmaceutical companies. Alza Corporation, Johnson & Johnson, Shire, uh, Novartis, and a few others. I don't work for any now and haven't for several years. And um, I do write chapters for books. I don't get royalties, but this is an advertisement. This is a book coming out in 2011. This is my uh, acknowledgement that I, maybe not to be trusted or, or what, but I, I do think it's important to acknowledge that. But, uh, the, this, this book uh, is uh, <clears throat> a very interesting book on uh, a term that I had um, 
not been aware of, uh, neuroethics. And I do think there are ethical problems associated with the evaluation of ADHD. Uh, and it's outlined in this book. Uh, uh, a group of us wrote a chapter for this book where we present uh, uh, the concept of ADHD as a spectrum disorder. Uh, the autistic spectrum disorder or the spectrum disorder for depression or for schizophrenia exists, but I'm not sure how many people have used the spectrum concept to define ADHD. But we did uh, uh, look at the spectrum disorder and uh, the difference between categorical diagnosis between symptom severity as a, a so-called dimension and as a behavior of a, of a dimension that is normally distributed in the population. And we went over uh, problems with each. Uh, for a categorical diagnosis, there is really a profound impact on this top-down definition of what a disorder is by committees like DSM-5 or ICD-11. So those rules will make a profound difference of how many people meet the criteria. This is an ethical issue when the criteria identify large numbers of people, as the criteria for ADHD might do maybe 10 percent or more of the population. I'm not saying that this is unethical, I'm just saying this is an ethical issue. And that's what this book in Neuroethics is about. Um, it's very odd in ICD-10, I don't know if people realize it or not, but ICD-10 is more uh, rigorous than DSM-4 for diagnosis. But how many people know how many symptoms you have to have for, to meet the criteria for ICD-10 compared to DSM-4? You have to have fewer. So why is it more rigorous? Why is the, with, with ICD-10, if you look on the right, left on here, you have to have 10 symptoms minimum versus combined type ADHD, you have to have six of ADH, six of inattention and six of hyperactivity and impulsivity. 12 symptoms total. This is hyper, uh, ADHD combined type. This is hyperkinetic disorder, which is the same symptoms, but typically using the R rule and um, symptoms from all the three uh, 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 domains, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. And what I've reasoned is in this, in this uh, article on neuroethics of all places, that actually the symptoms should be listed as uh, source specific. So there really aren't 18 symptoms of ADHD. There are 36. There are 18 you ask the parent, and 18 you ask the teacher. And then if you use the and or or rule, you can decide how many symptoms you might have. In ICD-10 criteria for hyperkinetic disorder, what I've reasoned is that they're actually 20 out of uh, 36 symptoms that are required to meet the diagnosis using the AND rule. And using the R rule for hyperkinetic disorder, for ADHD, you still just have 12 symptoms required at a minimum out of the 36 total. So actually this is a, uh, in this article, this is a rationale of why the ICD-10 criteria are actually more rigorous when you have to have actually fewer symptoms in the symptom count diagnosis than a DSM-4 diagnosis of ADHD combined type. So these are just some of the issues about diagnosis. Uh, the dimension uh, uh, approach is flawed when you use symptom severity because it's non-normal. Uh, by restriction of range and, and restriction of variance, when you use a standard deviation cutoff for a non-normal distribution, it does something even opposite of what you expect. A cutoff of uh, typically, uh, say, a, a standard deviation score of 1.65 should cut off 5% on the right-hand side of the distribution by your basic statistics. With uh, the SNAP rating scale or with any of the rating scales of this sort, it doesn't do that. Instead of 5%, it cuts off 8% because of the restriction of the variance with everybody having a zero score who doesn't have any of the symptom defined by, uh, by DSM-4 criteria. So there are some problems with cutoffs. And uh, the, con the continuum of distribution certainly has some problems too. Uh, I'm not denying that. But just to summarize, the categorical diagnosis, you'd have non-clinical cases in most cases if you think a psychiatric disorder is rare. And then you'd have sub-threshold cases. A spectrum disorder will let you evaluate those. And then uh, on the left, I can't find my pointer here. 
you would have ADHD and maybe hyperkinetic disorder, which has different criteria. Uh, it, okay, thank you. And then a dimensional approach gives you a non-normal distribution in terms of symptom severity, problematic. And then a continuum of behavior gives you a normal distribution where you can use regular statistics to do a psychometric evaluation and determine in a population sense what is severe beyond the cutoff and what's not uh, under the cutoff. So that's a quick summary of uh, what I think about diagnosis of ADHD. Um, I fear that DSM-5 is going to increase the, the administrative prevalence of ADHD. Administrative prevalence is how many children or adults are recognized and typically treated. It's not related to the state of nature, it's related to the rules you use for actually making the diagnosis. Uh, I hope that's not going to be the case, but I fear that it will be. Um, I think we probably have a prevalence in the United States, as I'll demonstrate later, that actually um, should have uh, reached an asymptote long ago, but still is continuing to go up. So uh, at the present time, we're diagnosing uh, uh, over 10 percent of uh, some school-age boys with ADHD and over 4 percent of some of school-age girls at certain ages. Uh, with the disorder. So it's a high percentage of children that are being recognized and treated by the current criteria. If that goes up, I'm not sure where eventually the logical stopping place is of what is ADHD or what's not. Uh, now I'd like to switch into the MTA. Um, <clears throat> the MTA is uh, a study that was started in, in the mid-90s. Uh, it was um, a follow-up study uh, because so many studies, we estimated more than 3,000 had been published on the effects of stimulant medication, the primary treatment for ADHD in the United States at the time. There were so many studies of short-term effects, but very few studies, if any, adequate ones, of long-term effects of treatment with stimulant medication. You know, some studies, were, uh, so, I don't know if you know the shortest length of, uh, of assessment for the impact of stimulant medication? One hour. I did that one. My first study on ADHD. So you can see the effect within one hour. And many studies would be a week or two weeks or a month. It's very easy to, because this is a, such a potent treatment and such an effective treatment that you can see the effect as it occurs. And you can see the effect as it wears off within a day. Uh, the MTA was, though, addressing another question. Let's treat children for a long time and see what the effect is after chronic treatment. And what do you think our length, uh, our definition of long was when we started the study? 14 months, over a year. Well, of course, now we keep changing what the definition of chronic or long treatment is. As you point out, we had a follow-up, then it became two years or three years, and now it's 16 years. But some people are being treated chronically, in other words, over maybe a decade, and no one knows from empirical information what the effects are of long-term treatment. So this is not only long-term effects, it's the effects of long-term treatment, of chronic treatment over time. So that's what I'd like to tell you a little bit about now in the MTA. Here are the collaborators. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but um, I would say the most important person in this study over the long term is Gene Arnold. He's the, the person who's been uh, the leading person to keep us on track and keep the study going. He uh, keeps the minutes, he organizes the meetings, and he just has been working with ADHD even longer than I have. He has brilliant studies that he's done in his career back in the 70s with animal models, with ADHD in dogs, uh, human studies. He's a fantastic investigator and he's still leader of the group. And then uh, our current leader is, uh, uh, is sort of emerging out of this group that we have uh, and is Brooke Molina who is at University, uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, she started off as an a, a investigator uh, at the Pittsburgh site where Bill Pelham was the principal investigator. Bill Pelham moved on to other universities and Brooke took over and she sort of emerged as the young person 
who was leading the MTA. Uh, the M 